Okay, in this video, I'm going to go ahead and um, and show you how you actually sketch energy eigenfunctions. The general idea is that if we're given some uh, potential energy, so let's say we have, this is just x, this is energy. If we're given some function, like this, where this is the potential energy, the question is, can we actually draw the actual wave function that exists um, in, uh, in these things? And especially in particular, if we have a certain energy, let's say that, you know, there's just some energy, energy level E and all right. Um, so that's, that's kind of the general, the general thing we're trying to do. And there, there it turns out there are six rules that Thomas More gives us, and I'm going to go through all of them. Um, in each case, I'm just going to draw these things on a different on a different axis. So, um, for number one, uh, is that the physically reasonable wave functions approach zero as uh, x equals plus or minus infinity. In other words, we're not allowed to have. So we always have to have wave functions that kind of go like this and eventually eventually go down to zero. The reason for that is that we talked about this before, which is that um, we uh, we need functions to be normalizable. In other words, if we actually, so wave functions, if you remember, uh, the wave function squared tells us uh, the probability of finding it someplace. Um, we need the probability of finding it anywhere to be one. And the only way we can have these normalizable is if these go to um, zero at infinity, because if they continue to grow or they get the same size at infinity, uh, then the, you're going to have an infinite chance of finding them in different places. So that's why you always have to have them going that. So you'll never see wave functions that look like this um, and go, you know, go off into the distance. That's not a, that's not an actual okay wave function. So that's number one. That's rule number one. All right. Um, so rule number two is that energy eigenfunctions curve toward the horizontal axis or our wavelength when E is greater than V of X. Let's just start with that first half of it. So, so let's just start with 2A. Um, uh, so all I want you to do is I want you to look at uh, this equation here, the actual Schrodinger equation, uh, which says that the second derivative of psi with respect to X is equal to minus some stuff. I'm just going to call it some constants. Um, e minus v of x times psi. Okay, so let's just look. Um, let's just look at some point here, and let's say we just want to draw what the wave function looks like at that point. Well, at that point, um, first of all, I want to point out that psi is positive. All right, because it's above the uh, the x-axis. All right, so this is this is just psi. Um, or this, uh, this is uh, doesn't doesn't actually have a, a um, an axis. So psi is positive. All right. Um, I also want to point out that uh, between here and here, you notice that e is bigger than v, and so e minus v. So e minus v. This is this is e minus v. All right. Um, that's just the difference between it. So this is also e minus v at this point. All right. Um, uh, e minus v is positive uh, for um, all the points in between these two, those, those two kind of squiggly dotted lines. All right. So this is positive. Oh, sorry. Um, so e, e minus v is positive. All right. Which means that this whole term has to be negative because this is positive, this is positive, and there's a negative out here, um, and the constants aren't negative. So, uh, so we get a negative thing here, which means we get a second derivative that's negative. Now, a second derivative that's negative uh, looks like this, looks curved down. All right, and so what you notice is that at this point, we're curving back towards the, the x-axis. Now, if we look at a point over here, e minus v is still positive here. We're still we're still in the e minus v positive regime, but now psi is negative, all right, because we're below the x-axis, and c is that we still have this negative c here. So now it's going to have a positive curvature. So that's something like this, and that's why we get waves, basically things that look wavy, um, on in the parts between. Uh, when when e is greater than v, all right. 
um, you can use those exact same uh, um, those exact same arguments to show that when e is less than v, uh, it's going to curve away from the x-axis here. Now we know we're, we know we're not allowed to curve towards infinity here. We're not allowed to do this, but instead what happens is, is we curve kind of down here, and we basically get these exponential tails. So it turns out that um, the wave is exponential uh, here. So it's x so exponential. Meaning it has it kind of curves down towards the x-axis, trying to get as close as it can. So it's exponential here, and it's wavy here. Um, wavy, basically, any place between these two lines where e is greater than v. Okay, so that's number two. Um, the second thing we're going to notice is that uh, the the how curvy things are scales as e and uh, e gets bigger than v, all right? So, um, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the next step. Um, well, let's look at that, let's look at that rule. And I'm sorry to keep erasing this stuff. I just feel like it's easier if we just keep kind of working on the same thing and I'll show you the completed thing at the end. Um, so the idea behind that is this, um, uh, the, the curvature, all right, again, we have d squared, this is three, um, we have d squared psi dx squared is equal to minus some constant uh, e minus v times psi. Okay. Um, when e minus v is bigger, all right, so this is where e minus v is bigger, this gives us a big number. Okay, so if we get a big number here, basically that means the second derivative is very big. Second derivative is big means that it's curvier. Okay, and so what we're going to find is that in these regions where the curvy, where it's really big, we're going to get we're going to get things that are really curvy. All right, uh, which would be great if I could actually draw sine waves going in that direction. There we go. All right, in this region where it starts to get where e minus v starts to get smaller we're going to start getting more things that are basically more spaced out. Okay, we're going to get larger wavelengths. Okay, so larger wavelengths when E minus V uh, is, is smaller. Okay. We're also going to find that, um, so, so that's kind of the curvature rule. All right. The next thing we're going to figure out is the amplitude. So the amplitude, it turns out, this is kind of a funny, uh, a funny kind of argument. And unfortunately, you guys don't get to see me in class. I normally do this by walking back and forth really fast. But the point is that E minus V here is just the kinetic energy. Um, if you have a region here where we have more kinetic energy, that basically means we're moving faster. The region over here has less kinetic energy, which means we're moving slower. Um, it's just a fact that you're more likely to be found in a place that you're moving slower than a place when you're moving faster, just because you spend less time in the place where you're moving faster. And so it turns out this these regions have higher amplitude because we're more likely to find them there. Okay. Um, uh, and so we're going to find that we have higher amplitudes where E minus V gets really close together. Um, the number five is just a straightforward thing, which just says that um, we're not allowed to have any, um, the, the things always have to look smooth and the wave function always has to connect to itself. So we're never allowed to have things that look like jagged things. Um, we're never allowed to have things that are disconnected from each other. Um, and finally, number six is that, and, and there's, there's, no, there's no way to argue for this, it's just something you have to remember, is the number of bumps corresponds to the number of energies. And so let, let's put that all together, and I'm going to draw the E5 level of, let's, sit, let's do the E7 level, the E7 level of this potential, all right? And so let's go through it a little bit at a time. Okay, um, so here's the E axis, or sorry, here's, here's, I'm just doing the wave function here. All right, and this is X. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Let's do a fun color. I'm going to do it in uh, purple. Great. Um, uh, so first of all, we are going to make sure we have seven bumps because there's uh, E7. 
Um, so seven bumps. We also had to be wave-like between here. So, so seven, seven bumps. Um, wave-like, exponential, exponential over here. Um, we're gonna have to have shorter, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, so number three is we're gonna have shorter wavelengths here and longer wavelengths here. And then we're going to uh, also find uh, that um, uh, that the amplitude is bigger on this left side than it is on the right side. So let's see if I can do all that. It's kind of hard to do, but we'll try it. So. Nope, I already messed it up. All right, let's see. Let's see if I did that right. And this this should go down to zero. Okay. Um, so how many bumps do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Great. Um, uh, we're gonna do E9, because I'm not redrawing that. Um, great. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, just like I wanted to. Um, nine bumps. Uh, shorter wavelength. Whenever the E minus V is larger. Longer wavelength over here. Um, larger amplitude. Places where E minus V is smaller. Smaller amplitude over here. All right, got all that. Uh, the right number of bumps now that I can count. Um, uh, let's see, did we get all the rest of them? Exponential on the left side. Exponential on the right side, wave-like in between the two turning, the two classical turning points. All right, that all looks good. That's how you draw a wave function, um, and we will do one more example uh, in the next video.